Welcome back, everybody, to another reaction video, and this is part four of World War I from Extra History. Uh, I'm excited that you guys have been enjoying this series as much as I have. Uh, it's been a fascinating watch. Uh, I've always been interested in the Great War and World War I. Uh, I know there are some things that I still have to learn. Hopefully you do as well, and we will all learn together. As always, please don't forget to hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. My daughter has 175,000 subscribers on her YouTube channel, and I'd really like to catch her as fast as possible. So every time uh, somebody new subscribes, I'm one step closer to catching up to her. So thank you in advance for that. But in all seriousness, uh, I put the link in the description to the original content creator. I've been so impressed so far with extra credits uh, as a channel and what they've put together on World War I. And I was told in advance to make sure I watch all the way to the end of this video. Apparently there's a song at the end that I don't want to miss. So let's dive in. The 24th of July, 1914. It's late at night. A group of haggard-looking men sit in a dim room in the ministry in Belgrade. One of them holds the Austrian ultimatum in his hands. They've spent the day debating how to reply. Defeated, they are about to give in to all demands. A notice slipped under the door. It says that the Russians have started to mobilize. They change their reply, and the final act begins. So, as we've been talking, there's a theme here of events that change history. And there are, n there are too many to count. We've already talked about those, and I won't go back and, and uh, recount those now. But again, we have another one of those moments where had they not been notified that the Russians started to mobilize, maybe history changes. And some of you have, have correctly made the argument that, hey, if it hadn't been what happened in July, something would have happened in September or the following spring. It does. There does seem to be a bit of inevitability, inevitability about all this that the great powers of Europe were going to go to war one way or another. And I honestly can't argue that that's probably the case, but it doesn't change the fact that this is a, just an absolute tragedy that could have been stopped so many times. And here's another example of when it could have been stopped. In their reply, the Serbians agree to nine out of 10 Austrian demands. They only refuse to allow Austrian officials to have police powers within Serbia. But their reply is a masterstroke, an act of genius in the way it concludes. For at the end, it says that if the Austrians don't find their terms to be fair, the Serbians are more than willing to submit to the resolution of a conference. But if you'll remember, the Austrians hate conferences. They are always getting outvoted at those things. But the bottom line here is that here's how it looks. It makes Austria-Hungary look like the aggressors. They've been counting on the world being on their side and Germany's been counting on the world being on their side. The whole idea, look at what happened. They assassinated uh, Franz Ferdinand. They were counting on public support being overwhelmingly on their side. And the reason this is a masterstroke is because they're taking the moral high ground back from Austria. They're saying, listen, we'll give in to nine of the 10. And if this is not okay with you, let's negotiate. Let's take this to the rest of the world. Let's get some mediators. Let's work this out. And then for Austria-Hungary to come back with, no, you didn't give in, it's war. It makes them look like the aggressors, which they are. Well, no more, not this time. They are livid at the Serbian reply, but like always, they turn to their German allies for advice. The Kaiser is still at sea, so Austria's foreign minister Berthold goes to consult Batemann Holwig and Moltke, the head of the German army. This is key. This is really important. And you're going to notice a theme that more and more and more the military runs the show. And not just because they're at war, but I mean just the country as a whole, especially in Germany, but in other countries as well. Uh, this is going to be increasingly taken out of the politicians' hands, out of the monarch's hands. And it's all going to be handing the power over the military. And the military at this point, we're a week before the war starts, the military uh, takes all of the momentum and starts building toward war. And by this point, it's out of the hands of people like Wilhelm II, Nicholas II, uh, and the folks in France and Germany and other places that are trying to avert war. They're apoplectic. They say, what, you haven't declared war already? A month has gone by. Get on with it. This isn't what we agreed to. We're losing the sympathies of the people of Europe. 
You see, after the assassination of the Archduke, public opinion in Europe weighed heavily against Serbia. It was politically impossible for anybody to support them then. But now a month has passed, and this reply, this meeting of most of the Austrian demands, yep. and this offer for mediation made the Serbs seem like the reasonable party. After all, what more could Austria want? So, with the rebukes <laughs> of the Germans driving him, Berthold returns to Austria-Hungary, and for the first time speaks with Konrad von Hotzendorf, the chief of staff of the Austrian army. He too is apoplectic. What, declare war? Are you kidding me? You needed to tell us weeks ago if that's what you wanted to do. The Austrian army won't be ready for war until the 14th of August, weeks from now. And this is going to tick off the Germans because the Germans, I'm sure they'll talk about this, unlike all the other powers, you know, they, they start their mobilization. They've already started and they're building up. In Germany, it's built into their system that if their armies on the Western Front mobilize, that automatically means they're invading Belgium and Luxembourg. I mean, that that there's no let's mobilize and get ready just in case. It's we're mobilizing. That means we're invading. We're going. So for Germany, mobilization means go right away. For Austria-Hungary, mobilization means we'll be ready in three weeks. So right off the bat, there's a kind of a disproportionate response to uh, the preparations for war. Plus, we don't even know who we're mobilizing against. You want us to prepare for war with Serbia? It, yeah, not when Russia's mobilized against us, we aren't. Get us a guarantee of Russian neutrality, and then maybe, maybe we can talk about mobilizing against the Serbs. Despondent, pressured toward war by the Germans, told that Austria isn't ready by his own chief of staff, Berthold returns home and begins to think. As the hours grow later, he starts to convince himself. There's a way out of this. He starts to reason that declaring war isn't necessarily the same as being at war. And so maybe if he declares war now, he'll placate the Germans and be able to use that threat to get the Serbs to capitulate before he even needs the Austrian army to be ready to fight. Now, we can all see this for the desperate rationalization that it is. We've all at one time or another gotten ourselves into an impossible situation and let ourselves believe in some wild harebrained solution that'll surely fix everything. Only when we do that, the fate of the world isn't usually hanging in a balance. And so, on the 28th of July, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, with Berthold all the while believing he's going to bring peace by declaring war. But that morning, the morning of the 28th, Kaiser Wilhelm II got back to Potsdam. That very morning, the Kaiser read the Serbian response to the Austrian ultimatum and uttered, With this, every reason for war drops away. And here is one of the great tragedies of those frantic July days leading to the war. This man, Wilhelm II, for all his inadequacies, for all his failings, for once in his life steps up and tries to become the man he should be, the man who deserves to rule the most powerful nation in the world. And he comes so close. And yet, despite his best attempt, he's too late. Again, just so close. And he was on vacation that whole time. Had he been there, had he been involved more, this could have been different. Austria-Hungary doesn't want to mobilize for war that fast. You know, there, it's just this, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the first episode, this whole thing, if you do a, just a really in-depth study of the July crisis, as it's known, you'll just find yourself screaming at these people because you see all of these opportunities that this could have been avoided. And it's not just like one or two things. I mean, there's 20 different times this could have been stopped. If any one of a number of things had gone different, and as a couple of people commented earlier uh, on the last video, it's almost like you know there's something behind the scenes forcing this to go this way. Like no matter what you did, it was gonna go in that direction. And yeah, here we are again, same thing. The world doesn't reward his effort. Things spiral into chaos. War comes and his empire will fall. The Kaiser tries to open peace talks, perhaps even hold a conference, but the Austrians will have none of it. So he proposes a novel solution, halt in Belgrade. Belgrade, the Serbian capital, is just a few miles from the Austrian border. If the Austrian army occupies the capital, they can declare victory and save face while showing the rest of Europe that they don't plan to annex Serbia. And they can do it quickly enough to perhaps keep the Russians out of the war. But this proposal has to go through Bateman, and Bateman's in Berlin. Now get this, it's 1914, so as impossible as it seems, there was no telephone line between Berlin and Potsdam. So Bateman can't reply directly. He's pretty skeptical of the halt in Belgrade plan, but instead of making the drive to Potsdam for clarification, he passes it along to German agents in Austria with the instructions not to press the Austrians too hard to adopt <laughs> it. And he doesn't even mention that it comes from the Kaiser himself. 
Meanwhile, in Russia, Sazonov gets reports of Austrians shelling Belgrade. These reports are false, of course. The Austrian army won't be ready to do anything until August 14th, but he has no way of knowing that. So he, one of the last men opposed to full Russian mobilization, lets the dam break and declares himself for a full mobilization of the Russian army. He and the Russian chief of staff, Yanushkevich, go to see the Tsar and convince him that the time has come. General mobilization is ordered. Night falls. And at that point, once general mobilization is ordered, though it's a little different than with the Germans, at this point the understanding for the Russian military is we are at war, even though it hasn't necessarily been declared yet. It's 1 a.m. and the Tsar can't sleep. He sends a telegram to the Kaiser of Germany, and it reads thus. His cousin. I'm glad you're back. In this serious moment, I appeal to you to help me. An ignoble war has been declared to a weak country. The indignation in Russia shared fully by me is enormous. I foresee that very soon I shall be overwhelmed by the pressure forced upon me and be forced to take extreme measures which will lead to war. To try and avoid such a calamity as a European war, I beg you in the name of our old friendship to do what you can to stop your allies from going too far. Nikki. Now you have to remember that these two men were cousins. They were friends. All the avenues of diplomacy had failed. All the standard bureaucratic mechanisms of the state were driving them to war. So they reached out to one another as cousins and as friends to see if the two of them dealing directly person to person could avoid this war. And in a touch that could only come from these twilight days of empire, did they not refer to each other as Tsar or Kaiser. They don't even refer to each other as Wilhelm and Nicholas, Willy but and rather Nicky. as Willie and Nikki. The Kaiser is awake too, and he responds. A flurry of telegrams get sent back and forth. At the end of these correspondences, Nicholas picks up the phone, calls Yanushkevich, and tells him to call off the general mobilization. Yanushkevich splutters and starts to reel off all the things that canceling mobilization means they're going to have to do, but the Tsar says, cancel it, and hangs up the phone. On the morning of the 30th, Sazanov hears what the Tsar has done. He's shocked. He pulls in the head of the Duma, the Russian parliament, and the patriarch of the Orthodox Church, and they go in for a knockdown, drag out meeting with the Tsar. The room is crowded, it's hot, talks are getting nowhere, and then Nicholas moves off alone, staring out the window at St. Petersburg, trying to think. After a few minutes of reflection, coming to no conclusion, a young man, an aide de camp, standing near the Tsar, says, Majesty, we know how difficult it must be for you to decide. Without intention, these words cut. Nicholas had always been called a weak, indecisive, feckless leader, and he hated it. He wanted to shake off all those names people had been calling him for so many years. He wanted to show the world he wasn't some wishy-washy prince who couldn't make up his mind. And so, like that, with the words of some aide-de-camp whose name history has forgotten, Nicholas turns around and says, I will sign the order. Back of all the times to want to show that you're decisive, he makes the order that costs not only his life, but the lives of his wife and children four years later, uh, because this war will end his monarchy, but um, it, it leads to the end of their lives as well. And uh, it's heartbreaking to, to see this unfold. I mean, I've seen it unfold before. I've read books about it, but to see it unfold again is just once again, taking me back a hundred years and thinking, no, there's, you know, there's gotta be a better way. Back in Germany, Batemans finally come around. They're starting to make progress with the Austrians on the Halt in Belgrade plan. The British have even said that this plan has their support. But Berthold won't accept it. Can't accept it unless the Russians agree to halt their mobilization. Which and they were going to we do. And here Catch-22 of the First World War. This is the age of the train. The period where logistics and timetables dominated military thinking. All around Europe, it was thought that if you could just get your army to the battlefield while the other guy's forces were still arriving, you'd crush them every time. You'd win without contest. And as we've seen with the Austrians, mobilization can take weeks. It is a Herculean task to coordinate and move the millions of men that made up a modern army. So most of the armies of Europe uh, bought into what was called the cult of the offensive, which is the idea that it was always better to attack, attack strong and attack first. And if you're being attacked and you find yourself thinking about falling back, don't fall back, counterattack. It's better to attack the enemy who's attacking you than it is to fall back and build a strong defensive position. This is just how they thought. And so this idea of mobilization is about, we can't wait till the other guy mobilizes because if the other guy mobilizes first, he can attack us and attacking is always better. So we've got to mobilize and it's all about trying to get there first because they believe that whoever got there first would win. 
And if Russia acquiesces and has her army stand down, they will be impossibly behind. If they stop mobilization, and then Austria or Germany decide to attack, they'll have lost the war without even a fight. So Russia cannot stop mobilization. But if Russia mobilizes, that means Germany has to mobilize too or face the same dilemma. And now with Germany mobilized, what can France do but mobilize themselves? After all, the Franco-Prussian War taught them a hard, bitter lesson about what happens when you get your army to the field too slowly. And they will not be making that mistake again. And so the dominoes start to fall. But there's one last attempt. One last try to stop that crushing chain of causality leading the world inexorably to war. Portales, the poor German diplomat playing a bit part in a tragedy that he has the desire but not the means to avert, has one last meeting with Sazanov. He says to Sazanov, call off the general mobilization. And Sazanov says, no. Portales pleads, for God's sakes, there will be no winner in this war. If we fight, it'll be revolution. It will be the end of monarchy. It'll right. be the end of us both. Won't you please call off this madness? And Sazanov says, no. Portales drops to his knees and says, if you do this, it will be slaughter. I beg of you, in the name of all that is right and decent, call off this mobilization. And Sazanov says no. Then Portales rises to his feet and takes a piece of paper from his pocket and says, in that case, sir, I have the honor to inform you that we're at war. And if I understand right, Germany actually had two declarations of war, uh, depending on how the Russians responded. And I think we ac they accidentally gave both of them to him. He's still struggling to collect himself, saying... Never thought I'd be leaving Russia like this. I don't know how I'll be able to pack. Sazanov kindly offers to send somebody to help gather his things. And a month later, a million men are dead. The seminal catastrophe has begun. In Flanders fields the poppies blow Between the crosses row on row That to say to that what a good way to wrap that up because we've been talking about these powerful men military men um, political leaders monarchs making these decisions but what they're really doing is making the decision that millions of people are going to die people that they would never meet people like uh, the man who I did some research into this week, I was hired to do some genealogy research uh, for a guy in North Carolina who follows this channel. And in the process of that research, found out that uh, he has family right here where I live. In fact, um, 
his great 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 grandmother is buried in the same cemetery that my great grandparents are in about 10 minutes from my house also buried there is his great great grandmother's brother who was killed on November 10th 1918 the last full day of the war he died the day before the armistice he was among the last of those millions who died because these guys couldn't get their crap together and come to some sort of arrangement. Don't forget to hit the like button. We'll be back in a couple of days with the next episode. Thanks for watching.